How can homeschooling parents enhance socio-emotional learning in their families? Today on the podcast episode, join me and Lindsay Castleman of Schoolio Learning as we delve into a conversation about self-compassion, resilience, and conflict resolution for our homeschool families. And if you haven't met me, welcome to the Homeschool Mama Self-Care Podcast. I'm Teresa Wiedrich, the Certified Life Coach and Homeschool Mentor at www.capturingthecharmedlife.com. Today, I get to introduce you to Lindsay Castleman. She's a veteran homeschool parent and certified teacher in Ontario, Canada. She heads up curriculum and content design for the education company she co-founded, Schoolio Learning. She spends her free time coaching her daughter's writing lessons, organizing field trips and events for her local homeschool community, and managing her family hobby farm and apiary. There were so many reinforcing nuggets of wisdom in this episode. Lindsay Castleman encourages us to know ourselves, to know our strengths and our weaknesses, to celebrate our strengths, develop our weaknesses, and know that our relationship with ourselves is as important as our relationship with others, and they all tie in one to another. I'm delighted to introduce you to Lindsay. So welcome to the podcast, Lindsay. Thanks for being here, Lindsay. I appreciate seeing all the things that you're offering the homeschool community. I especially wanted to have a chat with you about the socio-emotional learning element of Schoolio. So would you first introduce yourself to my group of ladies that are listening on this podcast? Yeah, for sure. So my name is Lindsay. Um, I'm a homeschooling mom to two for, wow, almost a decade now. Um, and before that, I went to school to be a teacher. So I'm a certified K-10 teacher. Um, and social emotional learning really became sort of my heart project with my kids. It's um, one of the things that, you know, um, I was bullied as a kid and I became a teacher to try and make a difference. Um, I left teaching and pulled my kids out of school when I saw that one teacher can't make a big difference. Um, in something that's a systemic problem. Um, so I opted to remove my kids instead. And then I started creating content to try and help other people like me, homeschoolers or teachers or any parent um, to create, to have the tools that they need and the language and the verbiage and the activities to help social emotional learning for their kids. And, you know, optimistically to to create better humans for the next generation (laughs) beautiful I think there's like such a push these days to encourage moms to engage their kids um, help deal with their big emotions and I think obviously that's really important but the real challenge Mm -hmm. is that we our generation We weren't, it's not assumed that we were taught how to deal with our big emotions either. So that's something that we're doing is engaging homeschool moms and helping them deal with their big emotions. Yeah. Yeah. And and the same thing goes for schools as well. You know, the government can say we want more SEL in schools, but if the teachers don't have the tools or the knowledge to teach it, because none of us were taught this stuff for the most part, those of us who are children of the 80s and 90s. Um, you know, social emotional learning wasn't a thing, emotional regulation and healthy boundaries and pro- conflict resolution skills. We didn't do any of that stuff, right? So not it's even new a- to everyone. It's new to teach students. Yeah, not even a discussion. And I hate to say that I'm also a child of the 70s. <laughs> ah, sorry. <laughs> this is a great <laughs> conversation. I actually think um, everything that we do in our homeschools very clearly, if there's a really stressed environment, kids aren't learning. And I know that myself, I couldn't have verbalized that obviously when I was younger, but I also grew up in a really tumultuous home. And when I left home and then went into college, I did nothing to shift uh, my like my study practices or anything, but I wasn't in a stressed environment and my GPA went up significantly. So I think that I'm just like a a natural experimental, um, you know, subject for exactly what we're speaking to. Exactly. We know that kids can't learn when they're emotionally dysregulated uh, or when they're in a high state of stress um, and they can't, they can't reason well either. 
Yes. Um, so, so the number one tool is helping them be able to self-regulate, help us know how to help them regulate while they learn to self-regulate and yeah. for everyone to, to know that it, uh, you know, a moment of dysregulation is not a teachable moment. You yeah. have to get the emotional regulation first and then you can have a discussion or logic or reason or, or learning. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I didn't know that as an early mom, I was just like, it's time to read. Let's get going. And when I remember, yeah, it's it's hard, hard. you know, you have toddler, a toddler throwing a tantrum and you're, you want to be a good parent and you want to like reason with them. And it's like, let me carefully explain to you why you can't have the toy or whatever they're throwing a tantrum about. But it's like, we don't, no one tells us that like, they can't hear you. <laughs> you know, they're, they're too dysregulated. They can't um, hear you. And then, but also from my perspective, and I know this isn't every mother, um, we all experience our kids tantrums or those moments of big emotion um, differently. But I can remember my early years, because I didn't know anything about emotions, or even tapping into how I was feeling. I wasn't accustomed to people listening to my feelings. I certainly wasn't listening to my own. So then if my child was dysregulated, which I wouldn't have called it a dysregulation, I would have called it a tam- tantrum, then I would have said, uh, stop doing that. You're freaking me out here. Like this is, this is actually triggering me and making me afraid. So that. Yeah, and then you're dysregulated too. And that, that is a mess. <laughs> yeah. That took me years, years, um, probably a decade and a half maybe a decade of coming to, um, you know, really coming into my own and acknowledging my own emotions. So that's why I always start with the, wait, how are you as a mom emotionally regulating? Mm -hmm. How are you engaging your own emotions? But I would love to hear your conversation or your ideas around, say, teaching a child to read that's having a challenge reading and they are pushing back and saying, no, thanks. I don't want to do this thing. But mom is like, we have to do this. You're five or you're six. But I know that other people, like even this yesterday, someone asked me about that specific scenario. And I know it's a repeat scenario for moms. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, reading's really tricky because we don't want to make them hate reading. Um, And and even as I say that, like, it's funny because I don't want my kids to hate math either or hate science, but we just, as a, as a society, we have this, like, we want everyone to love reading because reading is something we do for pleasure and enjoyment and, and to teach ourselves things. Right. So we really don't want to make reading instruction this battle, you know, where they hate it. And I had the same problem with my daughter. She hated reading. Even as a little toddler, like 18 months, two years old, I try to read to her before bed and she would slam the book shut and say, no, like she did not like books. She did not like reading. Um, And I think the, the, the number one thing I would say to homeschooling parents, like SEL aside, is just that there is, it's not a race to be able to read. Because your kid is five or six does not mean they need to be reading or they've seen everyone to um, to get reading, to get the reading lessons done. You can wait. In fact, um, all of those sort of science of how kids learn says that they're developmentally at the per- perfect time to read is like between seven and nine. So if you have a five-year-old who's not reading, this does not have to turn into a stressful moment for either of you. So you don't have to worry about it and you don't have to force them you can, if they like being read too, then just keep doing that. Mm-hmm. Like that's just the the best way to get them to love reading is just to keep reading to them. And then they keep engaging with text and they keep looking at words and they will eventually, they, they tend to get to a point where they want to read. Um, and then they are much more open to your help because mm-hmm. now they want to read. Yep. And you create that reading rich environment or that literature rich environment. But you know what? Sometimes you have kids just like yours that are like, no, thanks. <laughs> what do you do when you're in that scenario? You just wait. We did back, we backed off for the most yeah. part. Um, mm-hmm. So we backed off for a couple of years. Um, we kept um, introducing books. We actually started a family read aloud. So that was 
um, got her like less one-on-one, -on -one, less like this is a thing you need to do. Um, we started at, at Christmas time with like a novel, a Christmas novel. And then we just kept doing it where every day while the kids ate their lunch, I would read a chapter or two aloud to them while they ate. So now this is like replaced, you know, TV or tablet or toys or whatever. This is, you know, they got to eat anyways. And now I've injected a form of entertainment yeah. into that. Um, so we just sort of like kept and we kept buying our books and we did. She kept not reading them. <laughs> we kept getting books from the library um, and taking them back on read, but we just kept them around and um, made a real point of reading in ourselves. Like I made an actual effort to read more often when the kids were up and doing something. Um, you know, if they're playing in the living room, I'm going to go sit in the living room and I'm going to read a chapter. Um, just because I don't know about other moms, but I tend to do my reading after they've gone to bed. So they're not seeing it as much. Um, so I tried to make an effort there. And just like you said, just keep a like literature rich, book rich, book positive environment so that reading doesn't become this like awful thing that they have to do and that they hate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and hopefully they'll grow to come and want to read. If we haven't met before, I'd love to introduce you to what I do in the homeschool community, how I support other women in the homeschool community. I support women in varying capacities, but in essence, I would share that I support women working toward transformations, growth projects that they have. Sometimes that's transforming their frustration or figuring out how to deal with their big emotions, creating strategies and tools to address their big emotions in their homeschool, which naturally translates into teaching their children as well. Sometimes I'm working toward transformations for them in how they're addressing their overwhelm or dealing with boundary challenges, whether that's how they're relating to themselves or whether they're relating to others in a way that isn't satisfying. All of the things that I do, my intention is to help women walk toward clarity, confidence, and purpose in their mothering journey. The self-discovery that women often experience helps them understand who they are and why they are doing what they're doing at this point in their homeschool mom journey. Imagine how all of that speaks to their children along the way too. If participating in this journey sounds like something that you'd be interested in, you're welcome to schedule an appointment with me. Head over to my website, capturingthecharmedlife.com, and you'll see a booking link near the top of the page. Join me in a conversation to discover where you'd like to focus or if you would like to pursue a coaching relationship with me. I'd love to meet you. You know, the first time I met you, I think, was at a Canadian online homeschool conference. We were both speaking in, in some capacity. And I remember you speaking to the so socio-emotional learning element and me thinking, oh, we have to have this discussion here because that is one of the pillars, I'd say, that I see as a healthy homeschool mom is definitely learning how to address our big emotions. And you've got five pillars in your SEL program. And a few of them are, are very much how I engage or how I frame my self-compassion group coaching program. When you talk about one of them as being relationship with self, another one is character development, relationship with others, real world skills and strategies, and mindfulness and meditation. And uh, I love that. That's so very um, congruent or like almost hand in glove with what I'm doing. Uh, I'd love to hear how those developed and how you decided on those pillars. Um, yeah, so we we sort of took our pillars. Um, you'll know of the Castle um, program where they have the, the pillars of social emotional learning. Um, and we just sort of um, brainstormed as a team who are all parents, homeschoolers, teachers, like what is it that we really want our kids to be able to do that we couldn't do or that we weren't taught how to do and that we wish we were. And we've done this like broader where, you know, for our school stuff, it's like, oh, I wish I had more financial literacy. So we have a financial literacy program. I wish I had more emotional intelligence. So we have an emotional intelligence program. But then we did that again within the program. So it was like social skills. So 
how to um, how to choose. The first thing that I came to when my kids were in kindergarten was how to choose good friends. Uh, because we talked a lot about they were at five years old making friends with some kids who were like getting them into trouble, not the best behaved. And I'm like, why do you choose to be friends with them? Uh, I'm friends with her because she likes me. Okay, well, that's not really like the standards by which I want you to choose your friends. Like lots of people like you, everyone likes you. You can pick good, like healthy relationships. And that's where we start with like the kinders is like what makes a good friend. But that just grows with you as you get older till like you're in grade eight and you're starting to talk about other healthy relationships. Um, you know, with with other adults and with kids your own age and romantic relationships and friendships and all of that, where you you want to know that they know how to set boundaries and respect boundaries, that they know how to resolve conflict. Um, they know they have like cooperation and teamwork skills. They have leadership skills. And all of that is sort of that relationship with others. And then your relationship with self, I mean, they all tie to each other, right? So your relationship with self is if you're, you have good self-esteem, self-confidence, you're going to have the foundation for making better choices in your relationship with others and in your relationship with yourself. Um, so we, you know, the little kids, we start with like healthy eating and healthy sleep, healthy screen time use, um, and healthy physical exercise, all the things that um, usually like traditionally when I was in school, we did, you know, like the food chart and that was about it. I don't remember anybody in school teaching me that it, it's healthier for my body to go to sleep on time or, and certainly, you know, screens weren't really a thing then. So no, we didn't, we don't, we have to start teaching kids about regulating their own screen time and making those healthy decisions for themselves and not because it's a rule that parents set, right? Because then it all falls apart as soon as they get some independence out in the real world. So um, all of that sort of stuff. And we talk about uh, the media and the role it plays on our self image and all of that sort of stuff with the older kids um, and, and knowing yourself, your strengths and weaknesses, how to develop your strength or how to develop your weaknesses and celebrate your strengths. And, um, and all of that ties together, your relationship with self and your relationship with others all tie into each Absolutely. other, right? Yeah. Um, one feeds the other. So that stuff is all super important for kids. And then the character building um, it was like, what are the traits that we, we, we want for our kids? You know, we want them to be honest and we want them to be resilient and we want them to be responsible. So we made a list of all of those and then we sort of split them by age and talk to kids about that so that they're building character um, as they are also learning about their relationship with themselves and their relationship with others. And then the the, the real skills um, was just a lot of SEL programs out there I found are very um, like high level, like kind of fluffy, you know, it's like uh, find, find your inner poet and like get in touch with it. Like it's cool and it's great and it's good for kids, but it's like, it doesn't help you if you're having an anxiety attack in the grocery store, you know? So that's where we were like, let's teach them. If we're talking about emotional regulation, let's teach them some like concrete calm down strategies that you can use when you feel emotionally dysregulated. And, you know, if we're talking about anxiety, let's teach them some real anxiety management exercises that they can use when they need it. Mm -hmm. um, and even, um, even like our character building, like leadership skills or um, strengths and weaknesses or responsibilities, you know, we talk about um, time management and prioritizing and ways we don't just, there's one thing to say, it, you should be responsible or you should be resilient. It's another thing to say, being resilient will help you in these ways. And here's exercises to help you build your resiliency because if you don't tell someone how to get better how can they get better you just told them the thing they need to be the reason why but you also have to do the how if you want them you want resilient kids you have to teach them how to be resilient you can't just say that you want them to be resilient I'm curious when you're talking about, okay, so you're, we're talking about a few things that I really want to go into. I'm writing these little notes on the side about teaching conflict, conflict resolution, 
understanding exactly what boundaries are, especially with kids, resilience, how to build resilience. And um, um, there's another one and I've, I've lost it now. But um, when you're doing that, what's the process that you go through with kids? How, how do we, are, are you on an online platform? Do you have live classes? Um, so our program, we have two different ways that you can access, right? We have um, our books. So the books are all designed exactly like all our other homeschool curriculum. You have a lesson, um, which we've, we try to make as easy to use as possible. So if you know nothing as mom about SEL, that's okay. You guys are going to read it together and you're going to learn together. Um, so it's forward facing. So if you are really uncomfortable, you can just read it like a storybook and it talks directly to the kid. Um, and then you can hopefully branch off of all of those into like, oh, I remember a time when you and your sister were having this problem. Or um, I remember a time when I had a fight with my best friend when I was in fourth grade. And let me tell you about that. And then you start sharing stories and examples because real examples from their real life are the most concrete for them. Um, so if you can read about you know, talking about conflict resolution, you can read about conflict resolution, and then you can say, this is just like this episode that happened to you, then you're making those connections. Um, and then you go on to like, so how, what are healthy ways to resolve conflict? And um, how, how do we apologize sincerely and make things right when we make mistakes? And just letting kids know all through the program that mistakes are normal that mistakes happen. We all make them. We're all human, that it's an opportunity to learn and grow. Um, and what's important about mistakes is how you handle it afterwards, right? So um, so then, so our program is always the lesson first, which we hope engages some conversation at home. Um, and then some sort of practice um, work follow-up. So sometimes it's an activity. Um, sometimes it's like a worksheet or like a sorting activity or go outside um, and and lots of mindfulness activities in there as well so that kids can practice mindfulness because, um, as you know, my, mindfulness can be difficult. It takes practice to get better. Um, it's not it's not like a, I'll show you how and then you can do it anytime, you know, so it's really good that we have them continually practicing mindfulness. You know, when you speak about um, the stories are you the most useful element for kids to learn from, especially when it's parent stories, I've learned that anything related to character development or anything that we do, building boundaries or conflict resolution or not conflict resolution, doing things in conflict that's not healthy or engaging our big emotions, what we do, our life that's the biggest story. And that's the one that has the biggest impression on our kids. And, um, you know, in the moments where I think moms feel like, oh, I failed, or I, I should feel ashamed of how I showed up or guilty at how I've been engaging over the course of time. I just want to reassert or just say it again, that we do what we know to do today. And all we need to do is create a plan to learn how to do the the, you know, engage all of that in a way that is better tomorrow. And we just have to, like quoting Maya Angelou there, but I think we really need to remember that we are just like you said, always making mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. We just have to create a plan to grow. So we as moms are the ones that get to show our kids how to do life and how to do conflict resolution and deal with our big emotions and all those things. And that story right there, it's the biggest story, I think. Absolutely. I mean, our kids learn more by watching us do things than by having us pretend to, to be perfect yeah. and just tell them how to solve their own mistakes. You know, like if you can you can teach a child a lesson on how to take accountability. I can give you that lesson and I can give you the worksheet and you can have a talk about accountability, but they're going to learn a lot from you being accountable yeah. when you make a mistake like let them see that you are normal and human and you know you can say I'm feeling dysregulated I need five minutes yeah you know and teach them that they can also create those boundaries where yeah. it's like I need five minutes or I I showed up in a way that I'm not happy with yesterday or earlier today yeah. and I want to make that right and then you're modeling what's more important to them is not 
that mistakes don't happen, but how we show up when we do make mistakes and how we're like constantly bettering ourselves, right? Yeah. And and I know it's a normal mom thing to want to do the right thing. So we try to practice something that isn't really like fully aligned with who we are. And we're trying to work on that thing. Uh, But maybe we're not trying to work on that thing. We're not even conscious around some element that we're speaking to right now. When our kids get to be the individuating ages or the adolescent ages, some of them, not all of them, but some of those kids have a really strong BS meter and they will call us moms on the thing that we do not see and they will see us clearly. And so that is definitely one of the impetuses for me unconsciously didn't intend for this to happen, but for me to learn about myself is just mothering and homeschool mothering gives us so much more opportunity to learn about ourselves. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) arguing with a mini version of myself right <laughs> it's like but but we can we can both get better together especially if your kids are a lot like you um then it's all the more reason to see that reflection of yourself and and, and make and whatever changes you feel like you want to make yeah so I would love to hear how you engage the discussion of conflict resolution how you teach kids conflict resolution or just a few tools um, yeah, so let me think. Now I have to go into my brain on the conflict resolution um, lessons. We have, we talk about conflict resolution in a few different ways across a few different grades. Um, so the, the little kids, um, we give them some strategies where it's like, you know, compromise is a big one. So instead of fight, we're going to compromise. Um, we're going to talk it out or we're going to take a break. Um, or we're going to get help from a grown-up if we can't come to a resolution on our own. Um, and I think it's important to talk to kids, too, about how the, like they do this thing in school where it's like, we're all friends. Like, we're all friends. But it's okay if there's someone that you don't jive with. Um, you know, it's like, it's okay to not, to not really like someone. It's not okay to be mean or to be exclusive. So, um, you know, how to... That it's that it's you don't have to get along with everyone, but you have to be able to resolve your conflicts and your disagreements and stuff like that. Um, And then when the kids get a little bit older, we start talking about um, differing opinions. You know, what's an opinion and what's and how people feel about their opinions and um, how you can relate to someone who has a different opinion than you. Right. That that not everything has to be an argument. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, the same strategies apply as you get older, even for us as adults, you know, like, can you compromise if you're having like an argument with your spouse? Or it's like, can you compromise? Maybe. Can you take a break? Yes. Can you, you know, like, um, say you say you need a few minutes and, and come back later. There's all sorts of strategies. They really, they really work from kindergarten right up until adulthood. Yeah, um, they yeah, just look a yeah. little bit different, right? <laughs> I know the biggest book that's informed me about discussing conflict resolution is actually Marshall Rosenberg's work on nonviolent communication. And he was a hostage negotiator in the Middle East. So I think if he can do that, we could probably deal with a two-year-old. Um, but some days, <laughs> not every day. He speaks <laughs> about addressing people's feelings and, and just acknowledging their feelings and their needs. And that that's a really quick flyover of that entire book but it has it has helped me see the other person separately and acknowledging them in their experience in their unique feelings their unique perspectives and then when in close relationship wanting to honor the needs of the other person and it it, it's been really useful for me and definitely useful in sharing with others but the the thing that I hear a lot is how do you engage conflicts with your kids when it seems like it's always happening and you're you're teaching them but then you come back and you have to you know address it again and then they're fighting again because we as moms uh, homeschool moms hear it all the time so how do you engage parents that are challenged by constant conflict so between like siblings you mean yeah yeah um, yeah, I mean, the sibling relationship is interesting, isn't it? <laughs> like sometimes they're best friends. Sometimes they can't seem to get along at all. Um, so we 
always um we're big on like tools and solutions and compromises so what is the what is the argument about is it about um space you know you're in my space and do we need to have a talk about personal space and uh, people's like physical boundaries and who, you know, sort of what's polite and what's not polite? You know, that I remember when we were little kids and it's like you put your hand right in her face. It's like you're not touching, can't get mad. Right. But it's like, no, that's that's not yeah. nice behavior. Right. Like people have a personal boundary of space uh, mm-hmm. that we need to respect. And and a lot of times. I found with the sibling thing, it's more about respect um, and um, and just like, are you intentionally trying to irritate this other person? Because that's not the kind of character that we want to see. Um, or are you just like you live together and so you're fighting and you both want the same toy, in which case, you know, let's put a timer. We used to do timers for everything under the sun. Um, before before iPhones, it was the oven, right? It's like, okay, I'm putting the oven timer on for five minutes and then you switch yep. um, and just teaching them like, okay, you don't have to agree. You don't have to share. You don't have to play with the toy together. If that solution isn't going to work, there's got to be another solution where, you know, we can compromise in taking turns. Yeah. Um, and then, and if, if it's really like, if it's really they're purposefully trying to bother each other, then I think that you want to pull back into more of like character education. Um, like how do we show each other respect? Um, how do we earn the respect of each other? What and and when do we need to escalate this because we're young and we're just kids? When do we need to escalate this to an adult for help? Um, because I've tried all my strategies and they're not working. Um, and sort of pulled that back where if you can get, if everyone in the house as a family who loves each other can agree to basic respect for each other and that includes space and that includes you know your personal belongings and whatever else depending on your family um then then the conflict res- the conflict is less often because it's less intentional and then you can deal with each piece of conflict on a on a, as it comes basis You know, coming out of the the family scenario that I did, my family of origin, uh, my intention was to create a perfect family (laughs) without troubles to capture the charmed life. That's the name of my website. And I read all the parenting books. So I came up with, okay, here's how I'm going to deal with, say, kid conflict. And uh, so here's my formula. Now that I've graduated, launched three kids, my youngest is going into high school. Uh, in high school years, I can see now that a there is never a parenting formula. It won't work for every child. It will literally not work for I don't know. Some weeks it'll work, some weeks it won't. But I do think that we teach them what we do in our relationships, how we engage conflict. Um, we're all on growth trajectories there, so nobody has it figured at any point. But we have to come up with a plan for it. And I see that it, when we're engaging our kids in discussions about conflict over and over and over, because as homeschool moms, we're seeing it all the time. And sometimes it feels so overwhelming and we're just like, oh, okay, enough, enough with the, the arguing or the bickering or the, you know, she took my thing and he took my whatever. And so after a while, it gets really exhausting. But I saw that I didn't have to every single time speak to the thing. Sometimes with no created routine, I, it wasn't an intentional thing, but sometimes I was like, I have given you the tools to engage this. Perhaps right now you need to go cool down and I want you to consider how to engage it yourself. And um, I would not have thought that was an appropriate parenting tool early days. I thought there was a script. I had to follow the script every time. And now I'm like, wait, what's what's going on? We're doing this again. Nope. Actually, I have given you the tool. So I'll let you figure that out. So sometimes I think we just go, okay. So what do you think we should do or what Mm. you think you should do? Yeah. And I think that like conversation versus telling them what to do is really important too, because it gives them some autonomy and some power um, in this situation. And if you like what they're going to, they're going to be like, well, I wanted the toy and I was using it first and I, 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 and then it's like, but what do you think? Why do you think they, that your sibling did that? What do you think they were feeling? Yeah. And, you know, 
what do you both think we can do to resolve this? I would say that to my kids all the time. Mm-hmm. So guys, you know, you've both said your piece. What are we going to do now? And just like, I don't have the answer. What do you guys think? And if they need more, if they're just like, oh, I don't know, then, you know, they need more guidance. But over time, they learn to solve their own conflicts. And then, you know, I would have the kids come in. Mommy, can you put on a timer for five minutes? Sure. I don't even know what they're sharing, but they're now using that tool um, to, on their own, right? They like, they had a conflict or they both wanted it. They knew that this works for them is this timer thing. And they just, they asked me to put the timer on and I don't even know what it's for. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's like, you, then you see them like using those tools themselves. Right. And, and we've had, I, I, this one story I love telling my kids were they had friends over. So there were four of them total. And I told them they could make ice cream cones. So they're old enough to do it themselves. So they get in line, like a little line before them with the ice cream tub on the counter. And my son's scooping ice cream and my daughter behind him. This was a perfect moment. He was taking more than his fair share, given how many kids there were and how much ice cream there was. He was taking more than his fair share. And where a lot of kids would be like, mommy, he's taking too much. Or like, like, Kevin, don't take it all, blah, blah, blah. Or a fight would start. My daughter, who was like four or five at the time, she goes, Gavin, please remember to be respectful of the people who are behind you. <laughs> She's like such a little like professor with that language as such a small kid. But it's like, and and my son was immediately like looks behind him and he's like, oh yeah, okay. And he like put some back. And there was like no conflict. She was bothered by something he was doing that she felt was unfair. And she used that SEL language where she's like, she doesn't say you're doing something wrong. She says, please could be considerate of the rest of the people and that makes him want to want to do it right he wants to be considerate mm, that's beautiful yeah so what kind of ice cream do they make <laughs> you're going to learn how to it make it was probably the cookies and cream if they were fighting <laughs> <us>. <laughs> fight over. i love that um yeah i might be pining after ice cream because i haven't had lunch yet <laughs> You were, you know, I had one of my girls, I have three girls in college across the country. And I had one of my girls say to me a couple days ago, you know, you're right, mom, you said this thing about siblings being best friends eventually. And I'm glad that you encourage that or something like that. And, um, you know, it doesn't work in the moment when your kids are in conflict. And you say, you know, treat them respectfully, they're going to be your best friends someday. But it's true. And it was really heartwarming to hear her say that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. You, I mean, and they carry those those skills into adulthood, into their adult sibling relationships too, right? A super wild experience. We have text threads. And one of them was about how much the pound of butter was in their city. <laughs> it's it's pretty wild having adult children. Very different. <laughs> So the benefits of socio-emotional learning you shared are independence, emotional regulation, self-confidence, improved behavior, healthy relationships, and better grades. And now I know that not every homeschool mom is focused on grades or grading because, um, you know, there's a lot of self-directed learners or unschoolers. Um, but what would you say? What do you see as the highlights of a socio-emotional learning for kids? Um yeah, I mean, there's there's been a lot of studies on social emotional learning for kids, and albeit most of them are with school kids, but they do, you know, having those tools, being able to manage yourself better, whether that's stress or anger or just like, like time management skills or um, your relationships with other people, it's like you're just calmer all around, whether you're self-regulating or you're having good relationships with other people. Um, it all leads to that, like you said at the beginning, you're, you can't learn if you're not emotionally regulated. So yeah. grades are, are destined to improve. Um, if you're just in a, whether you, whether you do grades or not, your child will be learning more. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and then behavior obviously is just improved when kids have better skills for self-regulation and interactions with others. 
So I appreciated what you shared about socio-emotional learning, that it's teachable. It doesn't have to be like a default setting where we assume that everybody is just naturally arriving in the world with the capacity to do this. Because as far as I see, some kids do appear that they are much more natural at it, and some of them definitely not. Um, But you also shared that one of the reasons why we should engage in this is because there's a rise in anxiety, depression, and suicide in schools or in in kid populations. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there has, there was a rise in um, anxiety and other mental health issues before COVID, but after COVID um, and all the shutdowns and the disruptions um, there, the emerging evidence is that kids are struggling Um, that, well, everyone is struggling, um, but kids as well, because Kids really thrive on that like routine and um and just the comfort of of safety and like, like knowing what's going on and having the adults around them not upset yeah. um so covid did, covid took a lot out of kids and we gotta help them um uh, get back to that like mentally safe space um emotionally regulated Um, that comfort of knowing what's going on and you know if you develop an anxiety disorder it doesn't just go away later you know so some kids some kids go through um, anxious or angry um, or or maybe sad phases um, certainly and especially as our kids like hit puberty um, they definitely will have phases but a lot of this stuff is just not it's not going to go away if you have an anxiety disorder it's not going to disappear you're not necessarily going to outgrow it um so you need tools and a lot of us uh, as adults had uh, have anxiety issues and it's amazing what a difference the right tools make do you have some suggestions because you know as I'll just say that I know a lot of homeschool moms that have challenges with anxiety and, um, and often ADHD. And I see there's definitely a thread a combination there. Do you have some suggestions for the moms that have uh, anxiety? Um, I mean, the same tools work for kids as work for parents, right? So um, we change some things a little bit for little kids. <clears throat> we'll do like uh, deep breathing exercises. It's like, giving your stuffed animal a t- ride on your tummy, you don't need to do that. <laughs> you don't need to do Unless that. You have one. Um, yeah. um, I mean, you can go for it, but, um, but deep breathing exercises, grounding exercises, all that sort of stuff, uh, mindfulness and meditation. So mindfulness and meditation are two significant yeah. impactors on my healing, my health and yoga. The three things I did not understand um, the actual dynamics, why those things worked until the last maybe six months to a year, like doing the actual research study. And I knew it worked that I was a case example of it really is helping me process my energy and motion, my emotions. Um, but, you know, there has at least in a in a traditional community that I grew up in, the idea of doing mindfulness and meditation was like, nope, we don't do that. And, and I, I guess I want to bring it up because I know that it's a beneficial thing to approach your health and your anxiety. So what has been your experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I was a kid, I guess that sort of thing would be kind of like hippie, <laughs> like, like a nonsense or whatever. Right. And, um, yeah. But there's so many, so many studies now, and it's not just like, you can talk to lots of people like you or me or case studies are like, oh, it really helped me. But if you want to go broader than that, you can look at the scientific studies that show how beneficial mindfulness is to mental health. And there's studies, you know, with um, with veterans from the military, um, with PTSD and with trauma victims. And, and there's all sorts of evidence out there that it is working for people and that it does work. And it's like, it's, um, you know, we eat healthy for our bodies and we have to do healthy things for our minds too. We talk all, we talk about physical health all the time um, and mental health. We all, it's like physical health is like taking care of your body and mental health is like, ooh, 
like stigma and they're like, oh, there's something wrong. But yeah. mental health is not, it's just mental health. It's just like your body is is the vessel and your mind is what makes you you. And you have to take care of both of them if you want to be happy and healthy for a long time. So mindfulness is like exercise almost for your brain. You know, you want to, you want to do hard things and learn new things and challenge your brain so it can grow like a muscle. But you also need to rest it and relax it and clear it sometimes and and be present and all of that helps your mind as much as the other things too so yeah yeah, I think it's it's really helpful there's lots of adults who are anecdotal will tell you that it helped them there's legitimate studies that sort of prove scientifically that it's helpful um and it's great for kids too and it's something it's one of those things that's a tool that if you can learn how to do it when you're young it's easier to be like oh I remember how I remember mindfulness exercise I remember this I remember that and and access it even you know if they're at university and they're stressed maybe they haven't used it in years because they haven't had a lot of anxiety but now it's back but they still have all those tools in their brain somewhere yeah we did it for years. We would do a loving kindness, a loving kindness meditation and uh, in our circle time every morning and then do a little yoga some days and things that they were, of course, my kids are like rolling their eyes, mom, really? But I'm like, yep, let's do it. And I made it short, but it was like, let's practice doing it. So to this day, actually, literally to yesterday, I sent one of the girls um, a YouTube video, a mindfulness or a meditation video for her specific scenario. And I just, you know, they're so easy to act access. You can come up with pretty much any flavor of meditation or mindfulness that feels comfortable. Uh, you can just head over to, well, you can actually head over to my YouTube uh, list. I have a, an entire playlist for morning, evening, and um, daytime mindfulness meditation act- activity. Awesome. Yeah, 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 I, I really do. I think it's a powerful tool to really bring you into a quieter space. I really appreciate all we the. Had, th- um, we had little cards. I just got them like off Amazon. But there was like mindfulness and there was yoga stretches. Yeah. So every morning before school, we would do one of each. Yeah. Let the kids draw a card because they love drawing the card. And I mean, and it took like 10 minutes max. Yeah. And it always, our, it was, our days were noticeably smoother than when, when we skipped it or when we, before we were doing it. Yeah. And even if it doesn't have like a big impact in the day over the long term, you are reinforcing the, here's a tool, here's a tool, here's a tool to deal with with whatever the challenge is. Is there anything else that you would like to share with the homeschool moms? Um, No, I think the biggest message that I put out there is that you don't have to know this stuff and you don't have to be good at it to teach it, right? We tend to think like, I can't teach math unless I understand the math, but that's not how homeschooling is. We all know you can learn together and you can get better together and you can practice strategies together. Um, So I always think like the grades on the SEL are helpful in terms of the age groups that the activities are geared to, but really it's all beginner, you know? So you can be five, or 25 or 45 and you can still learn some tools and maybe you don't want to color a turtle but you know but the tools are still there and the the content is still valuable so don't feel intimidated about it um just because you feel like you don't know anything about it um it's perfectly fine to model to your kids that I don't know anything about this but I think it would be great for all of us So we're going to learn it and and we're going to talk about it and we're going to grow together. And then maybe they pick it up faster than you do and they can teach you something back, which is actually an amazing way to solidify learning, to teach it to someone else. Right. So just I think that's the biggest message is just don't be intimidated. Um, You can definitely teach this. You can learn with your students and you'll have like you'll be setting your kids up for success so much more. There was actually a big study of successful people, and it said the number one indicator of success in adulthood is emotional intelligence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're doing your kids a favor. I'd love to hear what books or resources you would recommend people learning more about the things we've been speaking to today. Um, let me think. So the for resources, um, there's 
a lot of great websites out there. Um, the Castle website, C-A-S-E-L, they have um, lots of really good social emotional learning stuff. Um, and really, I can't think of books off the top of my head. There's one, but I can't remember the author. Mer it's Marcia Berg something. Oh, I can't remember. Um, but really just like, I find um, you don't want to get overwhelmed. So if you sort of pick a thing, like something that either you really want your kids to know or is really being a big problem. So maybe it's conflict resolution. Yeah. Then start looking for resources that really like drill down on that one skill. And then you won't get really overwhelmed by all the big the big things. But there's so many resources out there. Well, I'm definitely going to recommend your website. So do you want to share with the audience <laughs> your website? Um, yeah, it's just schoolio.com. And um, we have, so if you want book learning, there's a bookstore. Um, then we also have um, all of our SEL as of this week is um, in online courses on the digital platform as well. Um, so you can buy the courses over there if your kids like watching videos um, better than doing like a reading exercise. Um, then you can do it that way. Love it. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate everything that you've had to share. Awesome. Thanks for having me. It was awesome to be here. What a pleasure to have a conversation with Lindsay about socio-emotional learning and how to use some of these tools inside our homeschool lives. If you're like me and you found that the most challenging element of our homeschool lives is actually addressing our own big emotions in all the sorts of possibilities, all the challenges that may arise in our homeschool life, then you're welcome to join me in a coaching call, have a conversation about how you could create strategies and tools to address your specific scenario. But whether you do or not, I'd love to hear about your experiences in homeschool. Is this the most challenging element of your homeschool journey? Send me a message. You can find me at Instagram, at Homeschool Mama Self Care, in my Facebook, Homeschool Mama Support Group. You're welcome to join the private group, the Homeschool Mama Support Group on Patreon. Just last week, we had a conversation about how to support you, a highly sensitive person in the homeschool journey in our homeschool mom room. I've included a variety of resources, many of them from the Schoolio Learning website, and also a variety of meditations, loving kindness meditations, and breathing techniques found on the show notes page to this episode titled Nurture Resilience and Big Emotions with Lindsay Castleman of Schoolio Learning. You can find that on my website, www.capturingthecharmlife.com. Until next week, I want for you and your homeschool kids to turn your homeschool challenges into your homeschool charms. You got this, girlfriend.